Th uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, uh, our work on toxin binding uh, uh, to sodium channels. And what I really want to emphasize today is uh, not necessarily the actual interactions with the toxins, though we're going to certainly talk about that, uh, but also we want to um, demonstrate how we can use toxin interactions to study how um, these uh, sodium channels function and work uh, um, in neurons. And of course, um, uh, it is known that sodium channels play a fundamental role in neuroscience. They are the, uh, um, uh, you know, the basis for um, uh, initiating and propagating uh, action potentials uh, in neurons and other excitable cells. And of course, we know from te um, textbooks on neuroscience that uh, these channels undergo a variety of, of, of states that they can exist in, um, resting states, uh, open and inactivated states. Uh, and and you'll, also, you'll often see figures <clears throat> where you have kind of um, voltage sensors coupled to gates and inactivation mechanisms. Um, but um, Really, we have very little uh, structural understanding of how, all, how these molecular machines work um, at kind of the atomic resolution. Um, and so that's really what we were after in, um, in these studies. And one of the main goals, the ultimate goals of understanding how these channels work and, and, and function as molecular machines is, of course, to try to um, identify novel ways of modulating or inhibiting these channels um, for future uh, therapeutic purposes. Okay, so um, uh, certain channels are very complex uh, membrane proteins. Uh, they consist of um, uh, 24 alpha, he uh, alpha helices that span the membrane uh, like, like this, and they're basically constructed, uh, shown in this uh, three-dimensional view of a bacterial sodium channel, um, where you can see a central pore domain um, shown in blue, which is made up of the um, the fifth and sixth alpha helices of each domain. Uh, there are four domains that are similar but non-identical in these channels. Um, also, there are four voltage sensors that are four helix bundles shown in green uh, that can, uh, are, are made from the first four alpha helices of each domain. Uh, within the voltage sensor, um, in the fourth alpha helix, there is a... Um, <coughs> set of positive charge residues that are known to play a very important role in detection of the electric field across the membrane. And presumably, um, these uh, charges are able to move uh, relative to the electric field. Uh, and this, these motions are involved in the gating of these channels. Um, now, the, these positively charged residues um, are clearly or very easily seen in the sequence of these channels. Uh, each, each voltage sensing domain um, has one of these, uh, but I'd like you to notice that uh, domain four, the fourth voltage sensor, has an unusually long uh, voltage sensor. Uh, this was uh, noticed early on uh, in the in the kind of studying the sequence of these uh, channels, but uh, no one has really fully understood why this uh, has occurred. And so I, um, uh, I I will show you among the things that I show you today. Hopefully, you'll understand why this voltage sensor is longer than the others. Okay, so um, voltage sensing channels uh, have, of course, four voltage sensing domains. One of them has, an has a specialized role, VSD4, which is involved in the inactivation process, which is different from uh, potassium channels that have four voltage sensors involved in, in activation. Uh, um, sodium channels have three voltage sensors involved in activation and one involved in inactivation. And this fact was appreciated very early on uh, even from you know the early days of the Hodgkin-Huxley equations uh, developed in 1952, um, that where uh, it was it was uh, they they discovered that in order to model the action potential, they had to um, uh, uh, consider um, four identical activation voltage sensors for potassium channels and three activation voltage sensors and one inactivation voltage sensor called H for sodium channels. And we know to this day that that is the case, and we and we know that it's VSC four that is involved in inactivation because of um, experiments sh such as this one where, um, uh, for example, the different voltage sensors can be uh, uh, neutralized with mutations and uh, only uh, domain four shows an effect on uh, inactivation properties. Okay, so before I get into some of the structural information that we've uh, recently um, generated, um, I'd like to basically give you a schematic view, kind of traditional schematic view of the sodium channel 
and then we'll, we'll go in and see kind of how this actually works um, in real life. Okay, so here's a, tip, a typical sodium channel. Um, I've kind of made a cross section so you can see an activation voltage sensor and VST4, which is linked to an inactivation mechanism. Um, we know that the inactivation mechanism has kind of a plug, a hydrophobic plug, that is contained within the, the loop between domains three and four. Um, but how this actually is plugging the channel uh, is, is not really well understood. Um, but, but we believe that if you have, uh, if you place the channel at a voltage that is around the uh, activation voltages of these channels, um, uh, so the activation uh, voltage sensors will move in some way in the upward <coughs> direction. Uh, and this, the, these voltage sensing domains are linked to uh, the activation mechanism, which causes the gate structure to be pulled open, which allows sodium to go through the channels. Once sodium goes through the channels, through a positive feedback loop, um, the membrane becomes uh, um, very strongly depolarized, which causes all the voltage sensors to move. Uh, and, but once VST4 moves into the upward position, uh, the channel is uh, shut off by this fasten activation mechanism. Okay, and of course these channels, uh, uh, so once, once, once the uh, membrane voltage recovers uh, uh, after the channel is inactivated, um, the channel can return to the uh, um, basal closed state um, and fire an action, another action potential. And of course these channels are constantly uh, fluctuating between these states which gives neurons the ability to fire uh, trains of action potentials as we know. Okay. So, however, what we don't know, we, there's a lot of holes in our knowledge uh, about how these channels work. For example, even uh, understanding how the voltage sensors move is, is, has been very difficult to obtain. Um, for example, I mean, people have theorized how, uh, how the voltage sensors move, uh, so move through little crevices uh, in the voltage sensing domain, or um, they've even, there's even been hypotheses where the voltage sensors can act like um, paddles that, uh, of a rowboat that can m make motions through the membrane. But really, there's very little experimental data to guide us um, in understanding how these voltage sensors move or, or how they are coupled to the gating mechanisms of these channels. And one of the reasons, of course, is that when we solve structures of sodium channels, where we purify these channels and pull them out of the membrane and make, uh, you know, generate uh, three-dimensional lattices for crystallography, or we prepare them for cryo-electron microscopy, we invar invariably are removing that electric field. Uh, and no one has really figured out a way to maintain the elect an electric field across these proteins while they're being having their structures <laughs> determined. So we don't really, so, so generally when you determine a structure of a, of a sodium channel or any voltage-gated channel for that matter, it's always at zero millivolts and the voltage sensors are therefore always in the upward most position. And so th that is the structure that we know. We don't know what the structure looks like in the down position. Now it has always been, it's been a long-term dream of ion channel um, structural biologists to take advantage of toxins that are able to bind to voltage sensors and, and modulate them and alter the voltage dependencies of those voltage sensing domains and basically bring them into other states uh, that we could potentially um, solve structures of, for example, down states. And so the first story I'm going to tell you about is from a um, peptide toxin isolated from the Peruvian green velvet tarantula. It's called Protox2. It's a very small peptide, about 30 amino acids. It's got this compact structure um, with three disulfide bonds. Um, uh, if you look at the sequence, you'll notice that it has um, four tryptophan residues, which is kind of unusual for a highly soluble toxin like Protox2. Um, uh, and, and this Protox, th this toxin is especially interesting to um, those of us who work on NAV1.7, which is the sodium channel involved in pain, uh, because this toxin is selective, a selective blocker for NAV1.7. Of course, we like to understand how it works and, and understand something about its binding site. Uh, Protox 2 does two things to sodium channels. It, it, it alters the conductance, uh, but it also shifts the voltage to the right. And this is a property of many different spider toxins. And it is believed that what is happening is that these toxins are, are capable of stabilizing the downstate of voltage sensors, which is exactly what we want to use them for as tools to try to capture a downstate structure. So uh, in our first attempt to uh, solve the structure of uh, Protox2 bound to NAV1.7, in our case, 
um, what we did was rather than uh, crystallizing the full NAV 1.7 channel, which is uh, technically challenging because it's very difficult to express in a very complex membrane protein, um, we um, decided to take the, uh, the binding site, which is known to be in domain two voltage sensor, and import that binding site into a much easily worked with uh, bacterial channel called NAVAB. Uh, and so we've made these chimeras uh, between uh, domain two and NAVAB in this manner. And making these chimeras is very tricky. It takes a lot of time and energy. Um, Hui Zhu was the um, member of our group that spent the time to make this happen, which took several years. But eventually, uh, she was able to derive uh, crystals um, of, uh, uh, of these uh, chimeric channels with protax through bound so, it, so we could solve the structure. Here's the uh, structure of this channel. Um, I'm not, uh, I won't, I'll show you protax too in a second. I just wanted to point out that in gray are residues that are bacterial channel residues. Um, and in blue and green are the NAV 1.7 residues that we have grafted onto this channel to generate the binding site um, on, on the context, uh, in the presence of this channel. So here is a protox 2 bound to the channel. Notice that there are four identical protox 2 binding sites. That is, be, that is because um, each of these voltage sensing domains are really a, kind of a VS2, VST2 voltage sensor. In real NAV 1.7, there would only be one binding site. But this allows us to kind of see how these uh, toxins are working and what their binding site is like. Uh, if you look at the binding site directly, you can see that they're kind of nestled on top of VST2. Uh, you can see that the four tryptophan residues are lying right next to each other, um, uh, kind of like um, uh, right within the outer leaflet of the membrane. And they, they actually um, uh, function as kind of a raft that, the, that this toxin can float on. And so the toxin is able, uh, and we know this from other data, toxin is able to float around in the upper leaflet of a, of a plasma membrane and do kind of a two-dimensional walk to find its binding site. And, so, uh, but, and we can see that all here in the structure. However, unfortunately, um, uh, we noticed that the structure was in the, um, had a voltage sensor in the upstate, which is exactly what we were hoping not to find. Uh, and we know that because of the position of these arginine residues in S4. These are the positively charged residues that are within S4. And we know that um, these arginine residues line up with the arginine residues of many other structures of voltage-gated channels that have been solved, all in the upstate. So this was unfortunate. We really wanted to get some downstate information. Um, and so, uh, however, what we hypothesized was happening was that these uh, toxins, um, which are known to be able to bind whether the voltage sensor is up or down, um, uh, how, uh, however, we know that they, are, that, that they are able to push down on the voltage sensor and kind of stabilize the down state of these voltage sensors. Um, so the hypothesis was that we had captured this low affinity uh, protox to binding site in our crystallography um, and, and uh, possibly because the, of lattice constraints that are um, um, forcing all the channels into this state. And really we'd like to capture this state to try to understand how, the, how these voltage sensors can, uh, can function and move. So um, we decided to solve structures by um, electron microscopy so that we didn't have uh, um, lattice constraints that would prevent us from seeing downstate structures. And so here is, um, so basically we um, solved the same protein uh, uh, structure, but using cryo-electron microscopy without a lattice. Uh, and here I am showing you this structure in gray. Um, that is aligned with uh, the crystal structure, the refined uh, crystal structure model uh, in turquoise. And you can see that these align perfectly. So this is really exactly the same structure as, as we had solved before. You can see the presence of protax 2 uh, on the surface of the voltage sensor. However, we found that this, this um, structure was present in about 65% of the particles that we examined by cryo-EM. We, we, we noticed that the that many of the particles actually had a distinct structure shown here, okay, that had significant deviations um, from the, the crystal structure. And you can see that here. For example, this S4, S5 linker alpha helix, um, uh, which, is no, which was present um, in this position in the crystal structure, it has now been pushed significantly downward in this second EM structure. Both structures we were able to determine at about four angstroms resolution, 
Uh, so we were able to get a very nice view um, of these structures. So now what I want to do is show you the differences between these two structures uh, and how this tells us something about how these voltage sensors are able to, to move in, within the context of the voltage sensing domain. So what we find is that uh, uh, indeed, the, the second structure has um, ar the arginine residues at a significantly lower position in the voltage sensor. So for example, um, if you look at R1, the first arginine in the S4, you can see that it's about 11 angstroms uh, down relative to its normal position that we've seen in previous structures. Um, furthermore, there's a rotation that we observe, about a 60, 60 degree rotation um, that uh, between the downstate and the upstate in the clockwise direction. So now what I want to do is show you some morph movies to give you a better appreciation of how these motions might be occurring. And, and just uh, to make it very clear that in a morph movie, we are kind of um, making an interpolation of what likely might happen between uh, the first state and the final state. But the first state and the final state are the only data that we have. So, so, but this helps us visualize how these motions might be occurring. Okay, so here is um, the movements between the down state that we observe and the up state of the VSD2 voltage sensing domain. Uh, um, in red, I am showing you the first four arginine residues of the voltage sensor. Uh, actually, it only has four residues. So, um, And you can see that there's a major upward motion uh, that occurs between the down state and the up state. Uh, um, when it, when, it, when it does move up, you can see that it pulls on this S5, uh, S4, S5 linker alpha helix uh, while it's making this motion. The rest of the voltage sensor is not moving that much. Uh, Protax 2 also does not seem to be changing in its structure in a significant way between these two states, really clearly indicating that Protax 2 can bind in both the up state and the down state um, of the voltage sensor. Here's, a, here's another view from the top where you can, see the uh, you can see the rotation a little bit more clearly. The arginine side chains are rotating by about 60 degrees between the down state and the up state. And here's a view from the bottom of the channel. Uh, you can see that, the voltage, uh, that the, vo the voltage sensor is pushing on this S4, S5 linker alpha helix that then put, uh, in turn pushes on um, the lower part of the S5 um, uh, helix uh, in the channel. And uh, it, it kind of causes a cinching of the gate structure from the, from the um, intracellular side of the channel, which is re uh, re somewhat reminiscent of a camera lens, um, which, which we believe is the mechanism by which the gate is able to open and close in these channels. Uh, this idea has been proposed before, but this is the first time uh, where we have um, a structural data uh, suggesting that this as a possibility for the gating mechanism of a voltage-gated ion channel. Uh, so now I want to shift gears to another um, project, uh, which is on an alpha scorpion toxin. So I mentioned that there are two types of voltage sensors, uh, voltage sensing domains in sodium channels, those involved in activation, and one of the voltage sensors at VST4 that is involved in, in, uh, involved in inactivation. And alpha scorpion toxins bind to VST4. Uh, and what they are able to do uh, and I should say they're slightly larger um, peptides, about 60 to 70 amino acids. Um, many of them have been cloned. We're working on a particular one called AAH2 from the man killer scorpion, which is an African scorpion. So these scorpion toxins are able to uh, dramatically uh, slow the rate of fast inactivation in sodium channels. And we know that they bind to the surface of VSD4. So, so the, the theory about how these are working is that they are basically preventing the um, voltage sensor in VSD4 from moving into the upward position and, and preventing the process or slowing the process of fast inactivation. So we wanted to see if we could use um, an alpha scorpion toxin to learn about how inactivation is working in sodium channels. Here is the structure we solved. So, so in this case, we did not work with a bacterial channel, but um, we worked with a full length sodium channel um, from, the, uh, from an insect called NAV pass, and we actually also made a chimera where we chimerized or we imported the binding site into this channel um, by um, humanizing the voltage sens sensor itself, or VSD4. Uh, you can see the presence of the scorpion toxin on the surface of VSD4, um, as shown here. Uh, clearly, it nestled on, on top of uh, VSD4 in this manner. Uh, okay, so um, 
the binding site of the scorpion toxin itself is fairly extensive on the surface of the voltage sensor. It is also interacting with residues on the, um, in the pore uh, loops, uh, including this glycan residue shown in, shown in red. Um, that is, that is, these are all part of the binding site of these toxins. Um, so now what I want to do is show you what is happening to the voltage sensor. We've noticed that the voltage sensor is in the downward position in a very similar manner as the voltage sensor was in our second Protox 2 structure. Um, notice that in this case, however, the voltage sensor is much longer. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, the voltage sensor in VST4 is about twice as long as the voltage sensors in the other um, voltage sensing domains of sodium channels. And what we see um, for the first time, because it's the first time this particular voltage sensor has been uh, uh, crystallized or studied in the down state, is that in the down state, uh, these extra uh, charged residues in the voltage sensor are kind of bunched up on the base <coughs> of the voltage sensor um, and interact with a patch of negatively charged residues on the upper surface of the C-terminal domain, which is nestled below uh, VSD4 in sodium channels. Um, and you can see that here in kind of a three-dimensional view. Okay. Um, so, um, we, uh, with the full-length channel present here, we can see all the machinery that is involved in, in fast and activation. Um, such as this, um, in, shown in red, is this patch of hydrophobic residues called the IFM motif that is involved in plugging the pore uh, during fast and activation. Um, you can see also um, two regions where there's an interesting interaction uh, that we, we observed. Uh, one we call switch one, uh, which is an interaction between these uh, lower um, residues in S4 uh, and these uh, negatively charged residues at the surface of um, the C-terminal domain. We also see another, a second interaction between an arginine residue uh, in the um, domain four, domain five linker loop, which is shown in green. Uh, interacting with some negatively charged residues on the base of the pore. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is show you some morph movies so you can see how this is changing uh, um, during uh, the upward versus downward <laughs> motion of the voltage sensor in VSC4. Okay, so here is VSC4 moving upward. Again, it moves uh, very similar to... Um, uh, the case of VSD2, there's an 11 to, uh, 11 to 12 angstrom upward motion that occurs between these two structures. Um, there's also the same clockwise 60 degree rotation. Another thing that you can see is that when the voltage sensor is moving up, it is ripping apart this interaction at switch one. Okay, um, These uh, residues are being dragged up um, as the voltage sensor is moving. Um, everything else is roughly staying in place. However, you can see um, a motion in this small S1N alpha helix, uh, uh, which is responding to the motion of the voltage sensor. You can see that it's kind of pivoting. And as it does that, it pulls on this string, kind of like a fishing rod pulling on a, uh, on a, uh, a uh, fishing line. And as it does that, it kind of unravels this alpha helix that is part of the domain three for um, linker. Okay, so, this t so we believe that these both are non-inactivated structures. We believe that we've captured kind of an intermediate uh, state um, prior to inactivation because the inactivation um, uh, peptide here, the IFM, is not in the vicinity of the, of the gating mechanism that we believe is, is being plugged by this, uh, by this hydrophobic motif. However, there's another structure that has been recently so solved that, ex that tells us what might be happening. Uh, so what we believe is happening is that the C-terminal domain is becoming destabilized as a result of the breaking of switch, of switch one. So when switch one breaks, um, th the position of this is destabilized. And we can see that in other structures. So in, in other channel upstate structures, uh, the, the C-terminal domain is, not, can, can, uh, is, is um, um, Dislocalized, and so it's not as it's not even present in the density. Um, so we think that the, the C terminal domain basically disconnects, uh, and I'll show you what happens when that when that happens. So I'm, here I'm showing you a morph between our APO structure in the upstate and uh, an, an eel electric eel um, NAV 1.4 structure that has the IFM plugging the gate, and you can see how we believe that that is happening. So once you rip apart uh, the the switch one interaction. Uh, 
the C terminal domain basically um, uh, destabilizes, allowing the domain three four linker loop to come in with the IFM and plug the gate structure in this manner. So we believe our uh, our current blueprint about how the process of fast and activation works is as follows. Um, so we have an upward motion of the domain four voltage sensor, which destabilizes uh, switch one, allowing this IFM motif uh, to come in and plug, plug the gating structure in this particular manner. Um, one of the interesting things about switch two is that it act, we believe that it acts kind of like a Velcro or a glue that holds down the voltage sensor, making it harder to push the voltage sensor into the up position. And so we hypothesis, we hypothesize that, that this could control the rate of fast and activation. And we've, we've made mutants to test this idea. So if we um, attempt to break this interaction with mutations, such as changing these negatively charged residues to positive residues, um, what we find is that, that we can generate channels that have much faster rates of fast and activation. Uh, so, so if we basically this is acting as glue. If we remove the glue, the voltage sensor is able to move up faster. And we know from many studies that 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 the voltage sensor VSD4 voltage sensor moves much slower than the other voltage sensors, which is an important aspect of the timing of how um, uh, between activation and inactivation. Uh, in essentially, um, the 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 you want activation to occur first prior to inactivation, and that's why this timing mechanism occurs. Um, and uh, we've also made mutants in the opposite direction where we mutate the positive charge residues to negative residues. If we reverse the polarity of this interaction, uh, we recover the normally slow rate of uh, fast and activation. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank um, the many people that were involved in this project at Genentech, um, uh, the people that worked on the, uh, I didn't have a chance to talk about our aerosulfonamide structures, so uh, here are the people that worked on that. Uh, Protox2, uh, we have uh, uh, people that solved that structure. Um, the AH AH2 structure was solved by a much larger group of people, including some academic collaborators that we brought in uh, to help us with that. Um, and thank you very much. Maybe we've got time for a couple of quick questions. So. Uh, about the ProTX2 part, the first part, yeah. and uh, you show two structures with uh, both incentive domain up and down, Correct. and uh, with ProTX2 bound state. And uh, I, it was not clear to me how the toxin uh, immobilizes the both incentive domain. It looks to be unaffected at all. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Uh, we know that it is required to push down the voltage sensor because if we, um, we know this required, uh, uh, without, without Protox2 around, we never see any down states um, in our uh, electron microscopy. Uh, and so what we, what we know from the structure of Protox2, and I didn't have a chance to talk about that because uh, I had limited time, uh, but we know that, uh, that Protox2 basically presents um, a, net, a positively charged surface um, right on top of the voltage sensor. And we believe that, that those positive charges, in fact, a specific residue, uh, an arginine at position 22 in Protox2, um, is really placed right on top of the voltage sensor. So we think there's an, actually an electrostatic repulsion between the toxin and the voltage sensor that pushes it down. And so basically, we believe it's an entirely electrostatic effect. Um, essentially, one way of thinking about it is that pr we believe that Protox2 is basically fooling the channel into thinking that it's that that there's a, a negative going uh, electric field across that voltage sensor, and then allowing us to see a down state uh, where normally we wouldn't be able to see that at zero zero millivolts. In the <coughs> okay, I think we better uh, finish up there because we've run over. Um, so we'll thank Dave again. And, uh,